This morning, I'd like to talk to you about health care. <laughs> now, I know that some people regard this as a somewhat controversial subject. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, because I'm here to tell you this morning that it is absolutely God's will that you would have affordable health care. <laughs> God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ absolutely want you to have this. It is your right, and they have provided it for you. <laughs> Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you see clearly from God's Word how much God and Jesus Christ have gone through so that we could have health care. 1 Peter 2 verse 24 says, Who, speaking of Jesus Christ, his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were what? Healed. Healed. By whose stripes ye might be? No. no. Someday possibly? No. Sometime in the future? No. No. Ye were healed. By his stripes ye were healed. This is one of the great accomplishments that Jesus Christ made for us. The other, there's another great accomplishment in that same verse that it talks about us having righteousness. By His shed blood, we have righteousness, and by His stripes, we were healed. God went through an awful lot <clears throat> to make sure that we could have health. It's always been a concern of God's, and that's obvious that God very much wants people to be healed when you look at the Word of God and you see how much attention is given to it throughout the Word of God. Do you ever think about in the Gospels how many of the miracles that Jesus Christ did involve healing? Yeah. Why? I mean, he could have done a lot more of the other kind. He started off with turning water into wine. <laughs> You know, he could have done that more often. He would have been a popular guest at weddings, right? Lots of people would have come for that. He walked on water. He could have done that more often. You know, there's one case where it talks about him rowing away from the shore to teach. Why not just walk out there, you know? That would have gotten everybody's attention. Every time he did a meeting, he could have just walked out from the shore about 30 yards or so and then just stood there on the water and taught. And that would have been a great demonstration of the power of God. There's another time where he, you know, told the, the future apostles to throw out their nets, and they ended up with so many fish that their boats began to sink. Why didn't he do that every time that he wanted to gather a crowd? He would have had a lot of people that would have come to see that. Or, talking about fish, what about the miracle of the loaves and fishes? Now, he did do that one a couple of times. But why not do that all the time? Why not every time he was going to teach, you know, have his boys go into town and put up, you know, billboards and flyers and say, you know, big meeting tonight followed by a fish dinner. <laughs> free of charge. <laughs> There's a lot of miracles that could have been done over and over again, but those weren't done over and over again. But what was done again and again were miracles of healing. Because that was such a need, and it's so important to God that we would be healed. In fact, God has gone to the great length of giving His Son so that we would be. You know, when it comes to God's health care plan, it may be kind of a catchy way of putting it, but seriously, God does have a plan for us to enjoy perfect health. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the benefits and features of this plan, and I think once you hear about it, that it's a plan everybody would like. You know, some people don't like the current one, and, 
You know, sometimes I feel like if people were as concerned about getting God's health care plan as they are about getting rid of the current one, we'd all be better off. But God's health care plan covers everything. First of all, it is extensive coverage. There's no <laughs> disease, there's no condition that you could ever have that this plan does not cover. And there's no exclusions or limitations whatsoever. Pre-existing conditions, no problem. <laughs> Talks about one fellow who enjoyed the benefits of this plan who had been born blind and another one who had been lame from the time of his birth for, and he was over 40 years old. That's a pre-existing condition, but boy, he was taken care of. <laughs> and it's open to everyone. It's open to everyone regardless of your age, regardless of where you live, if you're employed, self-employed, unemployed, it doesn't matter. This plan is good for everybody. <clears throat> you can keep your current provider if you like. You can even keep your current plan if you like, but you may find that you don't need either one quite as often once you start using this plan to its full advantage. Now, what do you think a plan like this costs? Free for us. Yeah, you're, you're right. It was a very expensive plan. It cost God his only begotten son, but for us it's free because it's already been paid for. It's already been paid for. Boy, think about that. Isn't that a shame to not use that plan if it's been paid for? You know, if an employer provided you with a health care plan that covered all of these things, you'd use it, wouldn't you, if you had the need? Sure, it'd be silly not to. What about this plan? Why not use it? God's gone through great lengths to give it to us. Well, we're going to learn about how to use it. We're going to learn more of just how we actually do use this plan that God has for us. It begins, like all good health care plans, with preventative maintenance. Turn to 3 John. Preventative medicine. That's a big catch word. Ever since health care costs started escalating, people started talking about preventative medicine. The more the cost of providing medicine went up, the more the insurance companies talked about preventative medicine in the first place. We got behind it. Well, it really is your best approach, preventative medicine. In 3 John 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things, above how many things? All things. That thou mayest prosper and be in what? Health. Health even as thy soul prospers. God is vitally concerned that we would enjoy health, just as he would be, is vitally concerned that we enjoy prosperity. And both of those things are according to as our whole life prospers. You see, when it comes to prosperity and health, they are not something that are just isolated or separated from the rest of our lives. These are not just kind of specialized categories. And it's not something that you really tap into by ignoring the rest of your soul life. These really have to work with other principles. And when it comes to health, it's not just something that we do or think about when we get sick. It's something that we need to think about in terms of the way that we take care of our entire lives, the way that we handle our whole lives. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, there's a great principle here that applies to every category of life. And you see the count, how big it gets in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 where it says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards stewards of the mysteries of God. We've learned recently about the mystery, the great mystery, and how big it is. And we are entrusted with being stewards of the mystery. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. 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 Now, stewardship is a great principle in God's Word to understand, and it's one that I invite you to really dig into, and perhaps at some time we'll, we'll look at this closer together. 
We won't go into all the details about stewardship, but one of the things that's important about stewardship mentioned in this verse is that uh, it's important to be faithful. And when you look in stewardship in the Gospels, you see that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. That if you want to be faithful, if you want to be a steward of big things, then you've got to take care of the little things. Stewardship carries over. You can't be a poor steward of small matters and at the same time be trusted with great matters. You have to learn stewardship and you have to steward your life. Stewardship applies to all of life. And I talked a minute ago about prosperity and health. If I wanted greater prosperity and if I asked you for help on having greater prosperity. But at the same time, every week when I got my paycheck, I was spending half of it on booze and cigarettes and lottery tickets. I'm really not being a good steward, am I? I really don't have a clear right to expect that God would prosper me more if I'm wasting what he's already giving me, right? That, that just makes sense, doesn't it? That's, that's basic principle. You know, stewardship, stewardship. Stewardship means that we have to, to take care of what we're entrusted with. We have to take care of what we've been given and manage it wisely. And stewardship is such an important part of health. And it's one that too often believers don't give enough attention to. Stewardship. I was part of a program <clears throat> that was built around five principles, part of a leadership training program that was built around five principles. <clears throat> the first one was to acquire an in-depth spiritual perception and awareness. The second was to receive training in the whole word so as to be able to teach others. The third one, which we'll come to in a minute, was physical training, making your physical body the vehicle of communication of the word as vital as possible. The fourth one was practice believing to bring material abundance to you in the ministry. And the fifth was to go forth in leaders, as leaders and workers in areas of concern, interest, and need. Now the reason why I bother telling you all five is because four of those five are never going to really happen if you, in a long-term basis, if you ignore the middle one and that is physical training, making your physical body the vehicle of communication of the word as vital as possible. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> when I was young, when I was 20 years old, 22 <laughs> or something like that years old doing this, you know, we kind of thought it just meant running and doing exercise. And we had some idea that some of the food that they were trying to feed us that we weren't particularly fond of somehow fit into this as well. But I can't say that at that age I really saw the greatness or importance of this or really got it, what it really was all about. Because I didn't really connect it enough with that part of it that said making the physical body the vehicle of communication of the word as vital as possible. This physical body is the vehicle of communication of the word. It's how you move the word with your physical body. Okay. I'm using my mouth, I'm using my hands, I'm using my legs to move the word. And if all of those are no longer working, I'm not going to be able to do that, right? right. You know, <clears throat> if I'm dead, it's hard to move the word. <laughs> There's a simple, get down to it, right? If, I, if I'm not breathing, I, I can't move the word anymore. That's, it's just that simple. You know, <clears throat> if you have a car, if you don't take care of that car, it's not going to run very long, will it? No. I, I found that out when I was young <laughs> and stupid. You know, I discovered with my, I don't know, about my third car that you actually have to put oil in these things. <laughs> you know, I found that out when I was driving down the road and all of a sudden I heard this god-awful sound of just bang and scraping and grinding and smoke started pouring into the car and came to discover that that was because I hadn't put oil in it. Um, maintenance. You, you need to, to actually maintain a car. 
and it'll only run as well as you do that. And that's true of anything that you are a steward of. This house would fall down around us if we didn't take care of it. If when it got a little hole someplace, we didn't patch that hole, if we didn't put paint on the outside. It's amazing how quick a building can just decay. It's absolutely amazing. If you ever see like one that's abandoned, how quick they can just fall apart on you. This house, same way. If you don't take care of it, pretty soon, you know, it's not working right. Lots of things can go wrong with it. And part of us being stewards and part of us believing and enjoying what God's done for us really gets down to our stewardship. You have to give attention to it. You really do. You really do. You see, life is designed to work together. There are natural laws and there are spiritual laws. And yes, the spiritual laws are greater than the natural laws, but that doesn't mean that you are at liberty to just abuse the natural laws and think that God can just always cover for you, right? You know, are the spiritual laws greater? Sure. You know, like, for example, it says in God's Word that if you drink any deadly thing, that you, you can be healed. But does that mean I should... Add a little antifreeze to my coffee every morning, even though it's sweet? It may be sweet, but I shouldn't do that, should I? Just because it says I can drink any deadly thing doesn't mean I should. So there's some deadly things that you might be drinking that maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> maybe not quite as bad as antifreeze, but some people would have you believe that it's just about. <laughs> you know... <clears throat> It's a point that I really do want to drive home, really drive home, that what we do, what we put in our bodies, the amount of exercise that we do, the things that we do to take care of our physical bodies are important to what we are, our health, our overall well-being. And yes, there are spiritual laws that can overstep and go beyond, and if you are going to, you know, eat a pound of M&M's washed down by three sodas and, you know, a pack of cigarettes a day. You know, I, I don't recommend that, I don't recommend you do that, but if you do it, I'm not telling you believe for the worst to happen for you. But boy, these principles should work together, not at cross purposes. You understand? Well, we'll keep going. Proverbs chapter 4, still in terms of preventative maintenance, Preventative medicine. Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. <clears throat> if you're going to go anywhere, you have to listen. You have to pay attention to these words of God. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they, they what? God's words. Are for, for they are life unto those that find them, and what? Health. Health to all their flesh. God's word, it says, is life, and it is health. It's health. A big part of preventative medicine is attending to these words. It's Learning God's Word, it's putting it on. It's learning to trust God. It's learning to understand and know what God's done for us and what He will do. The more that we put God's Word on in our minds, the more that we think God's Word, then the more it is health to us. It's health to us for a lot of reasons. It's health to us because that Word of God helps us handle all the pressures and stresses in life that can just wear you down. It's health to us because it is what is the basis of our believing. And it's what enables us to encounter situations and not be dragged down by the negatives of the world. It's health to us because it's God's Word that becomes the standard for us instead of the world. You see, 
You have a choice in life that you can either attend to all of the words of the world or the words of God. You can believe all of the negatives or you can believe the positives of God's word. And that's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice to either believe that every time somebody tells you, oh, be careful because, you know, the swine flu is going to get you. Or the bird flu is going to get you. Or the monkey disease is going to get you. You know, they all kind of sound silly anyway, don't they? Uh, just a little bit, you know, swine flu, bird flu, you know, monkeys says the start of this terrible disease. It all, why do you want to feed on that? Why do you want to worry about all those things? Why do you want to believe all of that? Why focus on the negatives? You know, it's so much harder to get rid of a negative than it is a positive. They've proven this. They've done, actually, now they can, like, map out the brain, and they've done that. They've mapped out the brain, and they've done all kinds of social experiments where they've demonstrated and they've proven that it is so much harder for our minds to get rid of negatives than positives. You know, the whole analogy of the glass half full, you know, some people see the pe glass half full and others see it half empty. And then you got these people say, well, I'm a realist. I see that it's both half full. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> okay. How you perceive that's going to affect where your believing is at. And it's going, to affect, it's going to affect your mood. It's going to affect everything in life. If you perceive that has, has half full, that does a lot of wonderful things for you. If you perceive it as half empty, it's really hard to shake that. It takes a long, long time to shake that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what we do with the negatives in our lives are so important. If we allow them to come in, if we attend to those words, if we incline our ear, and you can do that. You can choose that. You can choose what you incline your ear to. Do you incline your ear to the negatives? Do you incline your ear to like all the things of what's supposed to get you? Or do you incline your ear to God's words? In verse 23 here, it says, Keep, which is to guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. There's a great verse that we often go to when we're talking about believing. To guard your heart with all diligence because out of it come the issues of life. That's so true in every category, but here it follows right on the, the immediate context of talking about our health, our health. Preventative medicine, go to God's Word. Think God's Word. Make it an active thing to magnify in your mind what God accomplished for you in Christ. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16 verse 24 says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Do you have a sweet tooth? Do you like something sweet? <laughs> Try some pleasant words. <laughs> Try some pleasant words from God's Word. You know, that, you can have as many of those sweets as you want, and there's no problem. No problem at all. You won't put on any weight. You won't take care, you know, bring your health down. It'll, it'll raise it. <laughs> pleasant words. God's words. Those are health. I remember when I was young. See, I still can remember that, so I'm not too, too old. I can remember when I was young that, we, that young people, and they probably still do, just, you know, they keep it a secret from me, they would, we would avoid old people. Because <laughs> when you hung around, when you're with old people, you know what they always wanted to talk about? Negatives. Their negatives, their miseries, you know? Oh, you know, how are you? Oh, well, you know, my back's been bothering me, and, you know? Haven't feel so good any all the miseries. And you know, we didn't we, we didn't avoid them because we were you know, at that point trying to avoid negatives. We just didn't want to hear about it. Oh my gosh. Well, avoid them, okay? <laughs> and for heaven's sake, 
You know, if there's anybody else in this room that is old besides me. Really? Don't be that person that's just sharing your miseries with everybody. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. I don't know why, except that, you know, the adversaries convince people, why people are so, and I'll use the phrase, hell-bent, because it seems appropriate, on just speaking negatives, whether it's in the category of health or I had a bad day and so I'm going to rant, you know, I have to vent. You know what? No, you don't. You don't. You actually have a choice there. You, you don't have to vent. You don't have to let, you don't have to pollute the air with all that. <laughs> Why vent? Why pollute the air with all that crap? <laughs> Try thinking of a nicer word. But. Why? It doesn't help you, and it doesn't help anybody else. It doesn't help you. It actually makes it worse. You think that you, you may feel better, but again, they've actually done studies on this, and it only makes it harder to let go of it. The more you stay on it like a dog on a bone, the harder you have time of getting rid of it. So to talk about your miseries, to talk about the negatives, that doesn't help your believing. Every time you confess that negative, what are you confessing? Every time you, you confess that, oh, this hurts or that hurts, or that, what does that help? Be like the Shunammite woman. There her, she was, her kid had died. If you don't know the record, it's a great one to look up. It's, it's, a, it's in one of the kings. I'll help you find it. <laughs> Just look for Shunammite. Okay? Google Shunammite woman, you'll find it. Isn't that great? You don't even have to use a concordance. You can just Google Shunammite woman, and now you can find that. It makes life simple. But it's this great record in God's Word about this woman who, you know, this prophet, she had done something for her, and he said, what could I do for you? She said, I'd really like to have a kid. He ministered, you know, she got this kid, and, and then the kid dies. The kid dies. One day it gets sunstroke, and it dies. Oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine that. Can you? As a parent, anybody that's got kids, what that would do to you? Oh my gosh. To be able to handle that emotionally, mentally. But she so locks her mind in that when everybody asks her, she, she tells somebody, you know, her serving, get the horse, saddle him up, we're going, we're, gonna, we're leaving. We're going, we're going fast. And everybody says, what's going on? You okay? She says, yeah, I'm fine. Is, is your son okay? She says, he's fine. He's dead. She says, he's fine. Why? Because she refuses to confess that negative. She doesn't speak that negative to anybody except the one person that she trusted could do something to help, the prophet. What's the point? Now, if you end up, you know, down the line we'll get to this, if you, if you end up going to a doctor and the doctor says, how you doing? And, you know, you came to him for a real reason, don't just say fine, let him know what's going on. <laughs> Or if you're, and I'm going backwards here from third aid to second aid, if you come to somebody to, to, to be ministered to or prayed for, then you need to tell them. But boy, otherwise, there's no point in confessing negatives. In Proverbs 17, you don't have to go far, in verse 22, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. You know, and that's not just true metaphorically. Again, there's an effect. There is a, a chemical, physiological effect that our thoughts have. They trigger things. Your thoughts trigger chemicals. Happy thoughts, you know, they trigger certain chemicals that are actually healing to your body. And sad, negative thoughts, they work the other way. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. There's some medicine to take every day, you know. Do you take any medicine every day? Yes. This, okay. That's, I take that every day to keep my heart merry. That's, this is a prescription. If you'd like, I'll write it down for you, put it on a piece of paper, I'll send it to wherever you'd like. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Keep your heart merry. Guard your heart with all diligence. Guard it. Guard it. Guard it away from the negatives, from all the negatives about health and all those things. All right.